Amen. And I can tell you that that is that is one of the, that is the uh, the most appropriate video that we could have as we get ready to go into our sermon today. Again, it is good to see everybody. Thank you for those of you that did come out today. Um, my guess was before we got here that we would be at about 50% capacity. I don't think we quite made that. I understand. Um, but it is good to see everybody. Right now we are actually trying something a little bit different. We are Facebook live. And so uh, don't worry about Michaela down here. She's not just taking pictures. She, uh, we're, we're trying to, uh, to Facebook live. In addition... We will, uh, we will be putting the, uh, the recording of this service uh, up on our webpage uh, as quickly this afternoon as we can. So, But it is good to see everybody. Thank you for being here today. If you're a guest with us, you have absolutely blessed our heart by being here today. And uh, thank you. This is not the normal that we have as far as the way our services go, but uh, hey, it is so good to see you, and thank you for being here. I will be finishing up a sermon series that we've been preaching through Isaiah 53 as we've been getting ready, and we're walking toward, uh, toward Easter, and we're walking toward uh, the, the resurrection. Well, uh, in the Old Testament, as I've told you, when I was in seminary, they always told us about this scarlet thread that ran through the Old Testament, this scarlet thread that was a picture of Christ. Well, uh, as I've told you the past several weeks, I believe that Isaiah 53 uh, of that scarlet thread would have to be a six-lane um, superhighway because it speaks so clearly about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Over the past couple of weeks, we've talked about the fact that the Old Testament predicted that Jesus would be rejected by the world. The Old Testament talked about the substitutionary atonement of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We looked last week at, at the silent Savior, the fact that in the midst of everything that he gave for us, he never said a word. Well, we're going to finish up today. We're going to be in Isaiah 53. We're going to cover verses 10, 11, and 12 this morning. And uh, I, will, I will start this off by saying this. this. There are some areas and there are some things in this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at today that are a little bit shocking. Um, and, and when you look at it and when you realize it and when you hear it and when you understand it, my prayer is that it will be far less, uh, if you will, shocking. So if you will stand to your feet out of reverence to God's word, let's just read verses 10, 11, and 12 together. It says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. By him we're talking about the Savior, about Jesus, and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. Uh, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for today, God. We thank you, Lord, even in the midst of, of everything that we're seeing going on in our nation and worldwide, Lord, we know that you're sovereign. We know that you're in control. Lord, there's absolutely nothing that has ever caught you off guard. And so, God, we know that you've got a plan. In fact, God, we know you have a plan that's good in this. Lord, your word teaches us that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And so, God, I believe and I trust and I know, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan behind everything that, that is going on. And so, God, as we, as we take just a brief look today at this passage of Scripture, and, Lord, as we reflect on what it says, Lord, we reflect on the fact that you loved us enough that you gave your only begotten Son. God, it's my prayer today that we will not leave this place the same, but, God, that we will be challenged and we'll be changed in and through you. 
So God, you be glorified through everything that we do, everything that we say. And we pray this in the precious and holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen, amen. You may be seated. I want us to really jump into this passage of scripture. And there's some things at the beginning of this, in verse 10 especially, that uh, are kind of interesting that I want us to draw to. Let me, let me read verse 10 to you and then let's talk about it, okay? It says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him, it says, to suffer. Some of your translations are going to say this. They're going to say that it pleased the Lord to crush the Messiah. Now, it's kind of an interesting word. The, the word from the, from the uh, Hebrew language, excuse me, is the word kalfates. And, and what this word literally means is to take delight in. Now, in light of that, let's look at what this verse says again. It says, yet it was the Lord's will. Yet the Lord took delight in crushing the Messiah. Now, you see why it's kind of interesting to think about. It's kind of interesting to talk about. Now, let me be the first one to tell you that, that the Lord's delight was not in killing Jesus. The Lord's delight was not the Lord's delight was in the fact that you and I were separated from God eternally, and his delight was in the fact that that gap was bridged through Jesus Christ. But it's very hard for us sometimes for us to realize, it's kind of hard for us to even think about how God would delight in the crushing of the Savior until you figure out that Jesus said of himself that he drew delight in the fact that he would be crucified. That Jesus drew joy from that. You say, well, where does that happen? Hebrews 12 one and two. It's a passage of scripture, a couple of verses that are just wonderful to mind, but I want you to hear it. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, it says, let us cast off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked before us. And then it says this. I'm going to start over. It says, therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us cast off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked before us. And then it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And here's the part that I want you to get. Who for the joy set before him, Endured the cross, scorned its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. What the Old Testament said that God found delight in, the New Testament says that Jesus, our Savior, the Messiah, found joy in. Now, I don't understand that. My brain can't wrap around that fact. But I can tell you this. Jesus died willingly. For your sin. Why? Well, several verses in Scripture give us the word, the reason. John 3 16 tells us, For God so loved. Romans 5 8 says, God demonstrated this love. And that while we were yet sinners, that Jesus, the Messiah, died for us. And I want you to understand. That from, from Romans, uh, uh, I mean from Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it reminds us that he died for us and it was his joy to be able to take our sin, to take our pain, to take our punishment. Why? Because he loves you that much. God loves you with an everlasting love. The delight of the cross, the delight of the fact that your sin was covered, the delight of the fact that what separated you and I from a holy God was no more. To tell us thy, it is finished. The separation between God and man. Sin 
was done. The delight of the cross. What was this delight? Well, I can tell you that the delight of the cross was not the death of Jesus. It was the conquering of sin. Notice what it says in the last part of verse 10. It says, yet it was the Lord's will of the Lord's delight to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see, look at this part, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. You notice what the delight was? The delight was in you and I, the offspring. The delight was in the fact that you and I could trust in a holy Savior and call upon God's name for forgiveness and for salvation. And the scripture says that at that moment you go from being an enemy of God to being a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I don't know about you, but I praise God that he delights in the fact that I'm his child. I praise God that he finds pleasure in the fact that I'm his child. I praise God that Jesus says, I count it joy to be able to pay your price. What an awesome Savior we serve. Well, not only is there the delight of the cross, but there's the power of the resurrection. Look at verse 11. It says, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life. Be satisfied by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. I love that part. After he has suffered, it says he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Folks, we're just a few weeks away from Easter. Easter comes uh, just uh, just in a few weeks away, and we're uh, I'm looking forward to our uh, cantata, our musical. Uh, bow on my knees, I am, there's, uh, other than maybe Jonathan, okay, there's nobody more sick of the fact that we're going to be postponing that for a couple of weeks. But, again, I believe God is in control. I believe that God has a purpose and plan in this, and I believe, Jonathan, that God's going to use this in a way, and I believe people are going to be saved, okay? But, But the greatest joy that I can ever share with you is the fact that on the third day as the ladies were going to the old tomb and they were there, they were going expecting to find Jesus wrapped in the midst of that tomb. And when they got there, folks, I want to tell you, that there's all kinds of things that said they found. They found the rock rolled away. It said, but, but can I just tell you the greatest thing they found? They, they found that Jesus was not there. The ladies ran and they ran to get The disciples, they ran to get Peter and John. Peter and John took off running to the tomb. John was faster than Peter, it says. He got there first, but he got there first, and he was just standing on the outside of the tomb looking in. John may have been faster. Peter was more bold. Peter runs right past John, runs into the midst of the tomb. And it says that Jesus was not there. It's a fantastic picture people people have asked me I, I was reading some things uh and watching some things and and um you know there's there's these various people and youtube artists and all of that who who uh who claim that uh they they once knew the lord and now they've come to light i watched a uh, a video of somebody on how they deconstructed their faith and they no longer believe in Christ anymore and, and, uh, and all of this type stuff. And, and uh, um, the, uh, the reason that one of them said was they just couldn't grasp themselves around the resurrection. They couldn't grasp the fact that Jesus really died and really came back to life. Well, can I tell you something, folks? Every bit of our faith hinges on the truth. And it's an absolute truth. In a world that doesn't want absolute truths, it is an absolute truth. The every bit of our faith hinges on the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. There's no question about that. The Old Testament even foretold it. This was some seven, 800 years before Jesus But it said after he suffered, he will see the light of life, it says, 
and be satisfied. The power of the resurrection. Folks, I'm telling you that when those ladies got to the grave that day, that Jesus was not there. I'm telling you that he appeared to the disciples. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to others, over 500 other people that saw him. I want you to understand that history has proven it, and the Bible speaks very clear of it, that Jesus was buried, and three days later, praise God, He rose from the dead. And where the death of Christ gave us forgiveness like we talked about last week and like we looked at in this first verse, or in verse 10, where the death of Christ brought us forgiveness, the resurrection of Christ brings us victory. What do you mean? Can I tell you something really cool? I'm sweating like crazy up here, by the way. Can I tell you something really great? Remember when I told you how Peter and John ran to the tomb and John stood on the outside looking and Peter ran in? Well, it tells us that they found something very interesting there. It says that they went in and they did not find Jesus, but what they found was that his grave clothes were still there. And then it says they found his grave clothes. And then it says something really cool. It says that the head wrapping, which was called the napkin, it says that the napkin was folded and laid to the side. It's a Jewish tradition. We carry on that tradition today, by the way. It's a Jewish tradition that when you're at the table, if you are finished with your meal... You wad up your napkin and you place it there. That says, I'm done. If I'm at a restaurant and I'm finished, I will wad my napkin up. I will place it in my plate. That says to my server, that says, I'm finished eating this. Now, if I'm at my plate and i got food left, but I need to go to the restroom or I want to go, if, you, if you're like me, I have to go around and speak to everybody in the restaurants and stuff. So I'll go through and speak to everybody. Well, one time, I was about a third of the way through my, my plate. And I got up to go and say and talk to somebody. Well, my server made a mistake. They assumed I was done. Now, you can look at me. Don't laugh at that. You can look at me and you can tell, listen, I, I work at my, my meal plate like Picasso used to work in oils. I mean, it's a masterpiece, you know. And I came back and my plate was gone. And I said to my server, I said, what made you think my plate was done? Because my napkin wasn't folded up. My napkin wasn't thrown in the middle of that Well, the Jewish tradition was this. If you were finished, you wadded your napkin up. If you were not finished, you would fold it up and set it to the side. Same thing we do today. We fold it up, set it to the side, and that is a sign to our server, I'm coming back. Please don't take this. Let's put that into perspective. Peter and John run into the tomb, and they look and they find the grave closed there, but no Jesus but it says, and it, and it makes a note to tell us that the napkin that Jesus had wrapped around his head was folded and set gently in place over to the side. Why? Because the resurrection not only meant that Jesus was alive, but the resurrection offers you and I eternal life. Can I tell you something great? There's going to come a day. Could it be getting closer? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the world is going through unprecedented things right now. But there's going to come a day when the eastern sky is going to split wide open. And Jesus is going to say to me, come on. Come home. I was in line. I, I was over at Dollar General the other day and got to talking to a couple of ladies there and we were just we were just having a good time we were talking there was about 200 other people in there trying to get stuff 
I just wanted a Mountain Dew, I'm being honest, okay, a diet one, okay, I got me a diet Mountain Dew, and I had a few other little things there, but we were sitting and talking, and, uh, and that lady was talking about how crazy the world had gotten, and how all this hysteria and everything's going, and, and I looked at her, and I said, you know, imagine what it's going to be like when the, when the church raptures, and she looked at me, and she said, well, I won't have to worry about it. I won't be here. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not going to be either. I said, but here's the deal. What if I'm driving down the interstate? My, truck, I'm, my truck's not going to have a driver anymore. You know, and, and, and these type things. The hysteria that's going to take. Folks, there's going to come a day when the eastern sky is going to split wide open. And, and with a trumpet call of God and with a voice, it says, of the archangel, he's going to say, come home and forever and ever and ever and ever because my Savior resurrected from the grave. Forever and ever I will spend eternity with him. Praise God. And I can't wait for that moment. But there's a third thing, verse 12. There's the delight of the cross, the power of the resurrection. But verse 12 tells us there is a promise of forgiveness. Look at it. He says, therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Praise God for forgiveness. For all have sinned and come short of God's glory. That's you, that's me, that's every one of us. Jonathan, you guys come on back up and begin to play. For all have sinned and come short of God's glory. I, uh, I read a lot of things this past week about all the reasons why Jesus died. He died to be our substitutionary atonement. We talked about that two weeks ago. I read a whole article about how Jesus died to satisfy the requirement of God. In other words, there had to be a payment for that sin. I read about how, how all of these various theological theories, all of these various theological uh, things are there, and they're very true, and, and, and they're, they're wonderful. But, but can I just put it in real simple terms for you? Jesus died so that you could spend eternity with him. Jesus died to pay a price that you couldn't pay. Jesus died to pay for your sin because if you died and paid for your sin, you would be separated from him eternally. Jesus paid a debt that you could not have paid for yourself. Can I be honest? And those of you that are here, those of you that are watching via Facebook, there may be people that have clicked on Listen, we may have an opportunity today to, for people to click on and watch a sermon that they may not have even had an idea they were going to watch today. But can I tell you something? God loved you enough that he gave his son instead of having you have to spend eternity without him. Greatest love ever. Greatest love, greater love hath no man than to lay down his life. I am so thankful God loves me. I know me. I know the stuff that I have going on inside of me. I know every sin that I've ever done. Maybe not all of them. I know enough of them that scares me. And yet God loves me. Each of us have a debt. And I'll be honest, I don't want to know what your debt is. And I don't really want you to know what my debt was. My debt's probably bigger than many of yours. Sin after sin after sin after sin after sin after sin. And yet I called upon the name of Jesus Christ at the age of 19. 
a sinner destined for hell. And I called upon the name of Jesus. And I want you to know something. He saved me. I mean, not just a little bit either. He saved every part of me. And my whole list of sins, the Bible says that he put it as far as the east is from the west. That's a long way. Scripture says that he, that he placed my sin behind his back that his eyes could see it no more. He took that which was, was crimson and washed it white as snow. He did that for you. But can I tell you something? Can I be honest today? That's not automatic. You say, what do you mean? You see, you have the opportunity to either accept the gift of salvation or to say, I don't want it. I reject it. And more people will reject it than we're actually going to accept it. What the Bible says, broads the road. Broads the road that leads to destruction. Many find it narrows the path that leads to righteousness. And so I want to ask you an honest question today. Our crowd here, probably a third what it normally is. But I want to ask you today, and if you're watching at home, I want to ask you today. If you died right now, do you know beyond a doubt that you would spend eternity in heaven? There's only one way. Only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. I, I promise you. This world has tried to tell you there's every way and there's every way possible. Yeah, I'm telling you that there is no other way. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. That eliminates everyone else but Christ. So you can't be good enough to get there. You can't work hard enough to get there. You can't come to church enough times to get there. You can't sing in the choir enough to get there. You can't listen to your Sunday school teacher enough to get there. But I'm telling you, there's, there's one way you can. And that's by saying to God, God, I'm a sinner. And there's nothing I can do to fix this. But I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and save me. He said, that, that sounds very simple. Oh, listen, it's not simple. And let me tell you why. Because Jesus paid an incredible price for you and I to be able to call upon him. But you can trust him today. Listen, we, the crowd may be low today. But I just can't help but believe there's not somebody in here today who if you died, you're just not sure where you would spend your eternity. Can I tell you something? In the midst of a coronavirus outbreak, God will save you today. There's nothing that's stopping him. Nothing. He loves you that much. He gave everything that you could ever give just so you could be saved. Maybe you're here right now. Maybe you're listening online. And you're just saying right now, you know, my life's a train wreck. My life was a train wreck too. My life was loaded with sin. But he saved me. And can I tell you something? Regardless of where you're at right now, God will save you.